talk about my program. So you can see that I'll be talking about shelter wells, uh, the potentials for carbon sequestration. And uh, my program is uh, hugely focused on biodiversity and agricultural landscape. So I'll be talking quite a bit about that. And finally, how all of these are being to profit, something that we all look forward to. But uh, before saying any of those, I would like to talk to you about one of my most favorite movies today. It's uh, Interstellar. If some of you watch this movie, you know the story. If not, the plot is uh, Cooper is a farmer. He grows corn and he has a beautiful daughter and a son. So in one fine afternoon, he took his son and daughter to watch a baseball tournament. And as the match progressed, all of a sudden everyone stopped because there was a huge dust storm coming. And so the match was done and everyone wrapped and um, Cooper collected his son and daughter and rushed home. They could barely drive because it was so dusty, you could not see that road properly. And they reached home, slept, and the next morning when they were up, they found that their farm was covered with dust everywhere. And it was very dry, and it was so dry that the farmers could not produce their crops anymore. Our earth became unhabitable, slowly. And uh, Cooper went to search for another habitable planet in the space. Although this is a movie, but it was inspired by our very much uh, familiar situation back in 1930 when our prairie was very dry too. Our producer could not grow their crop. And like the movie, you can see the huge dust was from appearing that farmhouse. But we were smart. We did not go to space to look for a habitable planet. What we did instead is that we planted trees. And that's how Prairie Shelter Bell program started back in 1930, 35 around that time. So we planted trees, the trees helped retain moisture, blocking the snow, protected the crops from damage, and also slowly we left it to reduce tillage, which also helped. And we can see the beautiful landscape that we have now, a beautiful habitat. It's not only for humans, but also birds, microbes, and everything else on Earth. But now there's almost 100 years, um, and many of you know that Prairie Shelter Bell program is shut down a couple of years back, the question is that, do we still need these trees? Many of our producer farmers are finding these trees are blocking their big machineries. And also, these trees are occupying land. So are we losing our productive land? Or are we like, spending more time in the field because we have to maneuver the combines and other? So um, this is the area, one of the areas that I'm very much interested in, because now that we are talking about carbon, these trees have huge potential to sequester atmospheric carbon. And uh, so this is something I'll be talking today. So uh, this chart here is showing all the trees that traditional double program distributed since the beginning up to 2010. Almost 10 billion um, trees were distributed of 40 different species. And in land, these trees occupy 60,000 kilometers shelter plus in Saskatchewan. And if we measure provincial carbon stocks for six common shelter plus species, it's almost 11 teragram carbon. That's quite a lot of carbon those trees are holding up. And now we all love math because we, know the, we want to know the price. So if you, if you put a dollar value, it worth $600 million at $15 per rate. So this is what we are talking about for the whole province. Now I'd like to show you a comparison between sites that has trees and the sites that don't have trees. So the first two um, bar here are showing the site that do not have trees. So you can see that initial stock at age year zero, it's uh, somewhere in 70 ton per kilometer. After 60, 60 years, it still stays the same. However, the site that we have trees, the below up here, you can see that the trees site, even with um, considered the mortality rate, 
Still, this site captured almost double carbon. So that much carbon in the soil, that much carbon also in the trees, and a lot of those carbons are in the stem. So agriculture and a different kind of funded a project called um, ADTP. Uh, it has two phases. In phase one, we measured all the shoulder belts across Saskatchewan, and um, so we did that by uh, collecting information from traditional level program, and we have records of where the seedlings are planted and the length and everything. And uh, in phase two, now we are working on developing an interactive tool. Um, in that tool, we are hoping to make it available for both web and uh, also the cell phone, where a particular producer can enter information like uh, the length of shoulder belt in uh, his or her farm, and the types of trees that um, has in that shoulder belt, the height and diameter of those trees, and that will give an idea about the carbon sequestration potential of the shoulder belts. Um, down the road, we also expand, uh, would like to expand this for other non-productive areas like wetlands and um, road allowances, native hedgerows. So um, some of the questions in the previous presentation I was hearing, how do we quantify? So we are working on that. And we're working on making it available for everyone. So it might take a couple of years, but uh, we're getting there. In some pilot program, I'm working with some of our producer friends. A few of them are here today that I met. That uh, we are working in their uh, farmland and uh, measuring the shelter bells, the types of trees that they have, and also other vegetation, not only trees, like small shrubs and other, because those also have carbon potential. And um, so, I'd like to make this available so that you know we are ready for this uh, uh, growing concern about carbon economy. So, carbon is important, but also uh, yield is important. And uh, a lot of time we hear is that, okay, if we have all those trees, I am losing my productive land. And am I like, um, losing my money there? So here I am presenting uh, a compilation of 50 different study that was done across the world between year 1930 to 1975. And what I'm showing here in the x-axis is distance from shelter belt in units of shelter belt height, and in y-axis, yield in percent of field normal. So the dotted line is showing normal yield of unprotected field, the field that do not have trees. So what I am showing here is that if you have trees, yes, we will lose some yield uh, up to from 1 to 1.5 high distance. But then there will be an increase up to 6 times high distance, which continue up to 12 times. <coughs> If I try to put it in general language, it will be, if you have a shoulder belt uh, of 40 feet high, then you will lose your yield up to 60 feet. But then you will gain yield up to 500 feet. But then trees cost money, because you have to buy the seedlings and maintain um, wood is a problem at the beginning here. So here's some uh, rough cost estimate. One acre shoulder belt with a 30 year lifespan cost uh, roughly $50 per year. But it will increase yield by 10 to 12 percent on the 15 acres that the shoulder belt will positively impact. And for uh, particularly here, I'm presenting canola price. Uh, if it is like six bushel per acre, uh, shoulder belt could increase yield up to 54 bushel. And net benefit after excluding yield loss due to shoulder belt is still over $200. So benefit is outweighing the yearly cost. But beside uh, carbon and yield, shoulder bells and other non-productive areas like wetlands and uh, road allowances, they provide many other benefits to our agricultural landscape because they provide habitat for pollinators and soil microfauna um, and earthworms, all these beneficial microbes and insects, and which does a tremendous amount of job in uh, cycling our nutrients, um, doing pollination, providing beneficial insects that feed on harmful pests, and, um, and so on. So um, in my program, I am particularly interested in the abundance and diversity of these microbes that occupy shelter belts and other non-productive area, and how their presence influence biodiversity in the broader agricultural landscape. The hypothesis of my study is that non productive field boundaries provide a mixture of habitat that contribute to the diversity of uh, every ecosystem, particularly in terms of 
biodiversity, pollination, carbon sequestration, and soil biological activity with minimum negative impact on the adjacent crops. I have five objectives in this study. In the first one, I'm looking into yield by using some precision egg tools. And second one, I'm looking into the benefits and risk of having this uh, unproductive area where the trees will be growing. Third, weed ecology, because weed is a major concern. And uh, fourth, some uh, proposed design guideline that is suitable for the prairie. And finally, some economic and environmental analysis. So in my study, I'm working with three different types of site. One is uh, planted shelter belts, the existing one. Another one is native uh, hetero, which I also include some road along sites. And comparing those with open field, which is my control site. Um, so my study sites are surrounding Indian Head, uh, where I'm based out in. And some of the, you can see all the five circles here. Each circle has one of these uh, treatment sites shelter valves and native HO and open field. And particularly I'm working with canola in this project. It's a major crop and in 2017 it's actually one of the top crops that we planted. So in objective one, we're using our drones to um, see if we can develop tools and uh, other methods to utilize, um, to improve the, the product, like, so that the producers utilize um, input their production and also the influence of trees and shoulder bells on canola yield. Some of the pictures of our uh, drone data collection and we collected uh, the maps and images before seeding at the flowering stage and also before harvest. So um, this is a layout of the particular field site where I have uh, shoulder bells or native pictures up here and in three different transects I collected yield data uh, at various distances from shelter belt and uh, compared with those with the drone data that we collected. So using the drones we collected various uh, uh, indices um, using uh, sensors and uh, we are trying to correlate that by looking into the topography or um, and correlating with the yield if there is uh, tools that we can develop that we can tell our producers uh, to use those. So here is some yield data can see that as we go away from the shelter bells, uh, we are seeing not a very consistent pattern, but if I look at the average, still the treat site has higher yield compared to non-treat sites, but it's not very much. Um, quality data is much better, so in the seed oil quality, we're finding that um, the dotted line is here representing based on oil content, which is in the open field site that do not have trees. But in tree site, like the yield graph that I showed you at the beginning of the, my presentation, we see a curve pattern here. So um, we see increased in oil content and it is decreasing. And again, it is much higher than the uh, open field site. So in uh, the numbers here up here, in shelter level sites, we are finding 1,300 kilogram per hectare, whereas in open field site is 1,200. Roughly 3% increase in yield in terms of oil production of the tree sites. In objective two, looking to some uh, risk and benefit of keeping trees in agricultural landscape, and particularly with uh, focused on pollinators and beneficial insects like carbon spittle, soil microbes, and uh, birds. The layout is pretty similar. But uh, alongside yield, we also collected data on all these services. So first, I will talk about the pollinators data. And uh, in this particular part of the project, Dr. Corey Sheffield from Royal Saskatchewan Museum is my collaborator. And um, so in general, when we look at the bees in a industrial landscape, we theoretically, we see a declining uh, number in bees as we go away from the trees. And, but not all the bees respond to uh, uh, landscape equally. Some bees are smaller in body size and they travel less, whereas the bigger bees, they travel further, uh, much further distances. And you can see that the, their size differ quite, quite, uh, quite a lot. Some bees are really high and some are really tiny, then it takes a microscope to look at them. So in a uh, thematic situation, if I have a canola field and I have trees growing in one side 
and I, if I have all my bees up here, then based on their body size and the amount of uh, area that they could travel, uh, I'll be covering quite halfway through my feet, but then still there will be areas where uh, I don't have my bee friends to go and pollinate my crops. So, however, if I have tree rows growing the other side too, then I'm pretty much covering the entire field, and which will benefit in setting fruits and uh, increase yield. <coughs> so, in our particular Canada study here, we found that in terms of bee, alongside honeybee, we are finding many, many other varieties which we do not talk about much very often, with too much focus on honeybees, but these bees are also doing uh, a lot of job in pollinating the crops, and also there are uh, wasps that feeding on harmful pests. So we're finding a lot of bumblebees and soybeans, and um, yeah, so a lot of solitary bees, and some cavity nesting one, like leaf cutter bees, but the question is that which one is the canola pollinators? Because they, all the bees are pollinating canola or not? So the, our plan is to study some of the pollens that we are collecting from the bees and to see if uh, those are coming from the canola or not. So then we can say, okay, among all these bees that we are finding in the field, we, uh, these are the one is uh, contributing to canola aid. And another one is that some of the species that we are finding um, are also listed in the uh, in Sarah as an endangered or uh, species of concern. So this is also something to think about. Why are these bees are getting? Um, uh, we are losing them. Is it something to do with the habitat, or is it something with the way uh, we manage our agriculture with the pesticide application or other? So, but that's not my uh, topic today. So I'm not go much there. Yeah, so the special concern and endangered. But we are finding some of those species in our field. So another um, organism that we are focusing on the objective is uh, Carabid's ground beetle. So these are beneficial insects. They are a, a huge predator in the insect world. They feed on a lot of harmful pests, in, uh, like, in, uh, like aphids, maggots, ants, and some of them actually also feed on uh, weeds. weeds. So um, if we can increase the number of this kind of beneficial insects, then we possibly will be able to reduce some of the input costs in terms of pesticide application or insecticide. So uh, with the very preliminary data that we collected from the field, what is very interesting is that we are finding our population of carabids ground beetle is way much higher in the tree side, both shelter belt and native uh, hedgerows, compared to the open field side, which is very low. And between the tree side, of uh, the obvious the native uh, hedgerows, um, there's many diversity of trees and shrubs and vegetation has more of those beetles. And then compared, we're looking into soil microbes and uh, nutrients because uh, trees has all this root system that exerts a lot of uh, chemicals that attracts the soil microbes. We're trying to see if we have trees in the field are we attracting more microbes, more diversity of microbes. And the more microbes present, they can help in making the nutrients more available to the crops. And also like how this is treated with uh, both macro and micronutrient speech. So very quickly, some small amount of data I'm showing here today. Um, looking, I'm showing the DNA concentration of uh, microbes in uh, the fields. The consumption we are finding is uh, higher than non treat side, but this is again very preliminary data. A lot of the samples still down this stage. So this is the only year three of this project. So we hope to show you more data down the road. And also like what kind of microbes that we are finding there and how those are related to the uh, nutrient and energy and others. And the component is birds. Because that we are in the prairie portal region, so a lot of birds migrate through our um, landscape, and while they're using our land as a breeding ground, they're also contributing as a predator for harmful pests. So I'm also interested in these birds and what kind of birds we have, and what they're doing, the importance of those birds, and uh, as well as from the conservation perspective too. So the diversity is very much higher in both shelter and native natural sites compared to the open field. Um, if there is no habitat, then there is no birds there too, so which is uh, pretty obvious. In objective three, looking into weeds, because uh, a huge concern is that if we have all these uh, trees growing in the field or native hedgerows, are we risking our crop plant by uh, standing weeds into the crop field? 
So I had to measure, okay, as I go away from the three lines, yeah, am I seeing a decreasing trend or if there is a pattern at all? And also uh, collecting uh, soil cores to see, do some seed bank analysis, like are we having seeds that uh, will germinate probably just waiting for the right moment. So some data here, um, in the x-axis you see yeah. all 1P or 1N, P stands for uh, planted sugar bulbs and N is native vegetable site. Obviously there is no data for the open fill site. And uh, one thing is that native petrol site is natural, has uh, way more weeds compared to the shovelable site. And another interesting thing is that in planted uh, shovelable site, a lot of weeds are introduced. In native sites, a lot of weeds are native. And among those uh, weeds, one thing I'd like to show here in this chart is that in native site, a lot of weeds are non weedy. So those were not listed in our pretty um, weed manual, so we did not list those as a weed in our crop field, so it uh, kind of surprised me. I am trying to look into more to see what weed species are those, are those something beneficial and how much they are, those are encroaching into the field. Yeah, and then we also collected soil cores from various stems from the trees and grow them in the indoor uh, greenhouses for five cycles. In every cycle we counted how many weeds germinated and um, what's the diversity of the weeds, what kind of species we are finding. So a huge amount of work we are collecting, we are counting like 10,000, 20,000 of weeds in those uh, small cores that we collected, which is surprising. So uh, down the road, I should be able to present more information about uh, weeds and how it was linked with these uh, um, shoulder bells or individual sites in the field. In objective four, uh, we, uh, our plan is to see if we can uh, design some constructed, um, like uh, constructed uh, tree site for our uh, producer. Not, because a lot of our producers are not interested in um, maintaining shelter bells. They're more asking like, is there something that we can do where I can incorporate our crops and trees and I can benefit, gain some economic profit simultaneously. So particularly we thought of about a system called alley cropping. In this system, um, we grow crops in the alleys of tree rows. And for trees, we choose uh, Economically important one, for example, uh, I'm showing here civet thorn and buffalo berry. So civet thorn and buffalo berry are considered as a super fruit because of their high vitamin <coughs> concentration as well as antioxidant. And these kind of berries grow very well, particularly in our soil. So I was thinking, and my colleagues were thinking that if we can, we can try to see that how much economic return our producers can get if they grow crops in this tree crop combination. Because if you have an orchard at the beginning of the year, you do not get any economic return because the trees take time to grow. And um, however, once the trees are established, then you can start getting economic return from both trees and the crops. So the beginning year, you can get return only from the crops that you're growing alongside, but probably in five or six years, you can get double return. So in this uh, particular project, we have two sites, one in uh, Indian Head, another one in Brandon. The project is uh, in sixth year now, and um, trees are almost getting to maturity, so we should be able to collect both crop data and tree data. And particularly, we are collecting a list of data set from this project, uh, starting with yield, and also beneficial insects and soil properties, and also greenhouse gas emission. And we would like to see, do some economic and environmental analysis to see that is this kind of system is beneficial for our prairie uh, situation? And if so, is it going to be um, making our producers profitable or not? Some pictures from the project. Um, we are growing alfalfa and uh, canola and wheat in rotations in those sites. And um, these are the leaf cutter bee cells. We were interested to see if those leaf cutter bee um, besides alfalfa, whether they are also using um, the leaves from the trees, 
which they are, you can see in this picture, a lot of uh, leaf cutter bee uh, cluster in the trees. And also, yeah, some picture of the shrubs. So um, from so this is the sixth year, from this year onwards, we would like to see that we will be collecting both the uh, fruits data as well as crop data. And then we'll do a math and compare that to a traditional crop system and see between these two systems which one is more profitable and not really sustainable. So then finally, in uh, 55, we are trying to do some economic and environmental analysis. <coughs> Sorry, I forgot about taking out the animation. Um, anyway, in a particular traditional system, we have all these inputs when we go crop, seeds, fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, machinery. And then from out for output, we have crop yield which give us economic return. But in a modified system, we have way more inputs. For the rows in the left, we have to spend money. But for the rows in the right, those are non-market goods that we do not have to spend money. And then all, again, we get uh, output as crop yield. But the question is that, can the value of these non-market um, inputs, can we estimate those ones? And what does the past study show? For example, pollinators. Honeybees are the most economically valuable pollinators worldwide. Many crops need uh, the assistance of honeybees. So of the 100 crops that provide 90% of the world's food, where 70% are pollinated by bees, and globally, 9.5% of the total economic value of agricultural production for human consumption comes from insect pollination. So that is approximately 200 uh, billion we are looking at here. <coughs> Particularly for canola, because they are now working on this uh, project in canola. Um, honey is uh, considered they uh, contribute half of the pollination. And in 2013, total farm cash receipts in canola industry was 7.3 billion. And if we try to put the honey value for the 50% contribution, that would be almost like 3.6 billion. So um, these beneficial insects, they do provide a lot of services. And many times we do not uh, think about their contribution and do not look at the economic way. So I talked about all the uh, about shelter levels today, about uh, field margins in terms of uh, road allowances and uh, uh, native hedgerow site, but there are many other sites in the natural landscape that are uh, not considered as a productive area, such as wetlands and uh, other margins and uh, perennial grasslands. But uh, these areas, although they are not uh, suitable for growing crop production, but uh, they are also valuable. Probably it's the time that we would start uh, putting into some monetary current dollar value for this kind of lands. And probably with the upcoming carbon economy and all these debates that we are having, probably all these uh, unproductive areas could have the potential to become very productive from not the crop production way, but from the environmental service way. Yeah, again, yeah, they provide a lot of services, pollination, pest control, other service could be like uh, sequestering atmospheric carbon and also water quality. So um, my interest is to work on like how can we retain these areas that will increase our encourage ecosystem services, which will ultimately uh, help in increasing crop yield. But I do understand that um, all these are externalities. I mean, our producer friends retaining all these areas, they are not getting anything, any economic return. However, these areas are benefiting everyone, all of you, myself. Um, by cleaning our air, by sequestering atmospheric carbon, by providing fresh water. So um, we have to find a way to provide incentives to the producers. This could be uh, giving credit in terms of tax credit, in terms of carbon credit. So these are what some of the areas that I would like to do down the road as I collect more data from my study. So with that, I'd like to thank all the collaborators in this project. So definitely, it's a huge project. I cannot do everything with my small team up in Indian Heights. So a lot of collaborators are involved from all over Saskatchewan. 
and uh, my fantastic team up in Indian Head. Um, and uh, although I do not have a slide here, all the producer friends uh, who are collaborating with this project. I'm working on almost like 30 producer collaborators here. So with that, thank you very much, and I would like to take some questions if there are times, which I think there are. My, my question is, you mentioned there's a yield and oil quality advantage within certain distances from the shelter mills. Is there any relationship between yield and oil quality based on the direction of the field relative to the shelter mill? Thank you very much. Very good question. Um, it's very much related with the microclimatic modification from the trees because once you have the trees, uh, they retain more moisture also um, makes way more soil microbial presence there. So uh, not only one way, but it's the multiple way they modify the microclimate condition, which ultimately um, provide benefit towards uh, fruit stacking as well as uh, like uh, green quality, soil quality, quality. So we are looking into some of the physiological studies to, to pinpoint if we're seeing a higher oil content, what this is related to. Is it a uh, little more moisture? Is it to the wind production and other? Uh, the Don Conic uh, 109. It seems we've come full circle in, in the shelter belts, and it's interesting. We've, we've gone from the need in the 30s, and then they've diminished, and now we're looking at, at some real, real benefits again. And this is just a I think that we, it is my observation that, that weed sprays are probably the biggest threat to, to shelter belts that are out there. And I'm wondering if there's a way that we as a pastor, as individuals, can encourage both private industry and perhaps I Canada to continue to do some more intensive research on mitigating uh, spray drift, either through, through mechanical means, better nozzles, better sprayers, or, or chemical means through um, additives that can go in the spray to, to help it to drop on the target without being uh, worn away by the wind. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I remember a few weeks before we had a workshop at the Indian Head about the project and another producer friend also mentioned the same concern. So they're about getting a better nozzle so that when you're spraying you're not damaging them. And another producer friend mentioned about probably down the road we'll be using robotics and others so we can more precisely do the spray and also applying pesticides and others so that we're not damaging the trees and shrubs. So not much work is going on in that direction, but there are some going on. But this is something definitely we need to uh, think about. Yeah. 